and move on to chapter six today, looking at bones and skeletal tissues. This will be the first chapter of three that are going to cover the skeletal um, system. <clears throat> so in order to start with, we're going to look at what, um, what is skeletal cartilage. We did go over quickly cartilage in chapter four as a tissue, but now we're going to see how this tissue plays a role in the system of the skeletal system. Um, skeletal cartilage, to review, has no blood vessels or nerves. Okay. This is really important in terms of how cartilage uh, can function and what it does. Um, there are certain key words here. Right? So we have this cartilage surrounded by a perichondrium. Wherever you see this chondry or chondro, right? that has to do with cartilage. Peri means surround. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of terminology to keep Anytime you see chondry, think cartilage. Right? So the perichondrium, this is going to be a really important way the word is put together. We're going to see many things like this. Peri means surrounding, chondry, cartilage, and the eum is a covering of. What we have here is we have a dense irregular connective tissue, and that's going to resist outward expansion. This is going to be important in how we see cartilage actually growing. Now, the three types of cartilage we looked at briefly in Chapter 4. We have hyaline cartilage, that's going to be the tip of your nose, elastic cartilage, top of your ear, and fiber cartilage would be in the intervertebral discs. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about the hyaline cartilage. Um, this is a fairly strong cartilage. It provides support, flexibility, and resilience. Right? It's also the most abundant of the cartilages, so most of the skeletal cartilage is hyaline cartilage. Um, as I mentioned, nasal, right? we see this supporting the nose. This is actually a very important component of the nose. The majority of the nose that you see is hyaline cartilage. We also have the respiratory cartilage. Right? The respiratory cartilage reinforces the air passageways. It makes up the larynx. It keeps the uh, trachea open. Right? The rings that you can feel, if you touch your trachea, you can actually feel these hard rings. Okay? Those are all hyaline cartilage. The costal cartilage, right? costal cartilage is what connects the ribs to the sternum. Right? It gives the flexibility to rib cage to allow you to breathe. Um, we will see that when we take a look at the um, what's called the axial skeleton. Then we have the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage, these are little caps of hyaline cartilage that exist on the ends of all of our long bones. They are important in how the joints function. And we'll see they're actually due to the way bones grow. Uh, articular cartilage, you've all seen it in, if you've ever eaten like chicken legs, like you take a chicken leg and you cook it, that little, it almost looks like a little plastic cap on the end of the bone. That is that hyaline cartilage. Now, the other kind is elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage we find in the external ear, the top part of the ear called the pinna. Okay, it is more flexible. It has a higher degree of those elastic fibers. We also see it in what's called the epiglottis. And the epiglottis is a little trap door that closes on top of our trachea when we're eating or drinking so that food and liquid do not pass down into the trachea and therefore into the lungs. Okay. It has more stretch, more foldability, than hyaline cartilage. It will bend much more than hyaline cartilage will. The last one then is fiber cartilage. Fiber cartilage has really, really um, great distribution of collagen fibers. Those collagen fibers give it a high degree of tensile strength. So this we will see in compressible structures like the intervertebral discs. These are the discs that sit between your vertebrae. And as you step, they act like a cushion between the bones of your vertebrae. Right. Really, really, really important if any of you have disc problems. Disc problems can lead to all sorts of problems. We also see these in the menisci of the knee. When we look at the joint, the actual knee joint, we'll see there's really two joints there. And the meniscus made of this fiber cartilage is what allows us to keep that joint moving. Now, cartilage can grow. Um, the names of the cells that we'll see involved in cartilage are chondroblasts will be the cells that create new cartilage. Chondrocytes then will be the cells that support the already present cartilage. <clears throat> now, cartilage has an extracellular matrix that can be compressed. So we're going to see growth occurring in two different ways. 
One is called appositional growth, and this is growth from the outside. What, can, what you can imagine happening here is that the cartilage is surrounded by the perichondrium. Okay? That perichondrium on its innermost layer has lots of chondroblasts. Okay? Those are cells that can actually create more cartilage. They can lay down the matrix of cartilage. So that growth is occurring from the outside. Right? It's like adding, adding layers of paint onto a wall. Okay? Eventually that paint gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. Okay. The other kind of growth is something called interstitial growth. And this is growth you'll see from the inside. What we have here, and this is quite interesting, within the cartilage, we have the cells are in little spaces called lacuna. Surrounding those is the extracellular matrix. That matrix, even though it's firm, it can be compressed. So what can occur is the cells can actually divide within that matrix. As they divide, they lay down more matrix, and they can actually push themselves apart, and they can grow from the inside out. Now, these two things will happen um, depending on where the cartilage is growing. Now that's different than what we're going to see in bone. Bone is going to grow differently. Actually, bone, when we talk about bone, bone is going to grow through a cartilage precursor. So you must know these two different definitions of growth. The other thing that occurs as <clears throat> bone is growing, um, as cartilage is changing, we can also see the calcification of cartilage. Calcification of cartilage is where the cartilage gets more calcium and calcium phosphates added to it. It becomes hardened. This is a normal process as bones are growing, and it's one of the ways that bones can grow. And it is something that occurs with old age as well. So as we age, especially the costal cartilage, the cartilage that connects the bones to the sternum, they sometimes harden. They start to calcify. And that leads to a limited amount of expansion. So elderly people often have a harder time breathing because they have less flexibility in their rib cage, which is what allows breathing to actually occur. If we were to take a look at the human body, we can see different cartilages in different places. Okay, so these are color coded. So this bright green here, that's going to be the elastic cartilage. Okay, and we see that in the pinna of the ear, right, right over here, and also in the epiglottis. This dark kind of blue color, this would be your hyaline cartilage. So we see it in the nose. Okay, we see it in the costal cartilages. All of the articular surfaces. We also see it being very important in the respiratory tract. The last one, fiber cartilage, the red, we see in the menisci of the knees and within the discs, as well as in this area here called the pubic symphysis, okay, which is a special kind of joint as well. As we go through this chapter six, you should refer back to chapter four for the overview of the tissues that we did and look back at those histology slides. All right, so let's take a look at our overview. Now, what we're going to start off with here, we're going to start on, off with an overview of the skeletal system, and we're going to start off by classifying bones. We're going to do this in kind of broad strokes. Now, you may already know the names of some bones. I will refer to the names of bones. Okay, Chapter 7, we will spend the entirety of Chapter 7 talking about the names of bones, where they're located, and the different parts of them. Okay, I can't talk about the classification of bones without mentioning bones by their names. So just start listening to and picking up those names. Um, first way we classify bones is whether they come from the axial or the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is the axis of the body. So that would be the skull, the vertebral column, and the thorax. So if you imagine removing the limbs, including the hips and shoulders, you would have the axial skeleton. The appendicular skeleton, therefore, are the bones of both the upper and lower appendages. That's where the ap appendicular comes from. Right. So that would be the arms, including the shoulders, and the legs, including the hip. We can also classify bones by their shape. 
The first type of bone in terms of shape is what's called a long bone, and these are longer than they are wide. They're going to have some very specific structures that we will look at in chapter uh, later in this chapter in chapter seven. One example of this would be the humerus. The humerus is the bone of the upper arm right, of the brachium. The other kind of bone that we might see are what are called short bones. And these are cube-like. These are not perfect cubes. There are no perfectly cube, cube bones. Um, here we have bones that are um, usually about as high as they are wide. We would see these in the bones of the wrist and the ankle. Short bones may also be considered bones that form within tendons like the patella or the kneecap. Though the patella is also considered what's called a sesamoid bone. Um, and we'll see that uh, the, the short bone is a classification based on shape. Sesamoid bone is a classification based on origin. Okay, so it develops, um, I don't know if you know this, but babies, when babies are born, they don't have kneecaps. Right? Kneecaps don't actually develop until babies are growing and starting to move their legs and begin walking. Um, and the patella, the kneecap, actually grows within a tendon. It grows within a tendon that connects the quadriceps muscle to the lower part of the leg called the tibia. We also have flat bones, and flat bones are usually flat. They have a slight curve to them. This would be the sternum, or the breastbone, and most of the bones of the skull. Right, specifically the cranium. So these are curved bones that are flat. And they also have a very specific um, organization that we'll take a look at. And of course there are tons of bones that do not fit either of those categories. So we lump those into what are called irregular bones. These are bones that have a very complex, complicated shape that is irregular. So things like the vertebra, the hip bones, which are called the os coxae or the coxal bones, right, that have these very complicated structures. Now as we go through and begin looking at the different bones, you'll want to try and categorize these into these different categories. All right, let's talk a little bit about the function of bones. Bones, how do they function? Well, there's a lot of different things that bones do. Okay? Obviously, they support our body. These are going to create the framework. <clears throat> they will cradle the soft organs. Bones protect the body. The cranium is a collection of bones that forms the round portion of the skull, and it protects the brain. It's where we have some of our strongest bones. Not the, but some of the strongest bones. We have the bony thorax or the rib cage that surrounds and protects our lungs and hearts. Our, I'd say our second and third most important organs. Bones allow for movement. Our muscles do not work if they are not attached to bones. What muscles do is they simply move bones over a point of origin called a joint, and we'll talk about joints at length in chapter 8. Bones also provide mineral storage. Now you've all heard that you should drink milk, get your calcium to have strong bones, but it's actually much more important than that. Bones store calcium, so therefore they act like a reservoir for calcium and other, um, other ions. We need calcium. We need calcium for our neurons to work, for our muscles to work, for life to go on. If you're not taking in calcium in a dietary form, your body will pull that calcium out of storage, and the storage is the bones. If you lack calcium long term, your body will continue to try and pull that calcium out, and that will lead to a weakening of the bones. So the idea of drinking milk to get calcium to have strong bones is much more important than just to have strong bones. Okay? It's because we need that calcium for our heart to beat. We need that calcium for our muscles to contract, and that would include then how we 
how we breathe. If our muscles don't work, we can't breathe. Also, in our bones in adults, specifically in the heads of the long bones, we see blood cell formation. When we looked at connective tissues in chapter 4, blood was our fourth connective tissue. We said the cells that create blood cells are called hematopoietic stem cells. So the process of creating blood cells is called hematopoiesis. This is going to occur in the bone marrow. So located within the bone marrow, we have those stem cells, those precursor cells, that have the ability to divide and become all of our different blood cells, our red blood cells, our white blood cells, right? the various kinds of white blood cells, which we have not gone into in depth. These are extremely important. Red blood cells carry oxygen. White blood cells are our primary line of defense in terms of an immune response. And all of that then comes from bone marrow. All right, so now let's introduce you a little bit to when we're talking about bones. Um, if you were in, you know, say, uh, an elementary school classroom and you said someone draw a bone, they would probably draw a bone that's like straight with two round bumps on both sides, kind of like a typical like doggy bone. Right? But bones have a much more complex shape. The reasons bones have those particular shapes is based on what they do where muscles attach, where nerves pass through, where blood vessels pass through. So bones have these very particular and important markings, and you will have to recognize some of those markings. So to begin with, we're just going to take a few minutes and go through some of the terminology that we want to use. Right? Basically, we're talking about the lumps and bumps and holes on bones, but those terms, you can't use the lumps and bumps and holes. Right? So we're going to look at different terms that describe where we have site of attachment for muscles, ligaments, or tendons where we have potential joint surfaces, where we have conduits or openings for different blood vessels and nerves. Now we're going to familiarize ourselves with the terminology so that when we actually look at the bones in chapter 7, you can imagine you will need to know the name of the bone and then some of these specific bone markings. So this is the table that lists the different names of the bone markings. We'll take a few minutes and just read through some of these. I'll give you some examples. And then this will be much more clear when you see these specific examples on the bones. Okay. This is broken into projections that are sites of muscle and ligament attachment, projections that help to form joints, and depressions and openings that allow blood vessels and nerves to pass through. Okay. So I think of these as the lumps, the bumps, and the holes. Okay. The first one is a tuberosity. Okay. A tuberosity is a rounded projection. Okay. It may be rough. <clears throat> There's also what is called a crest. A crest is longer, it's more narrow, it's a ridge of bone. Similar to a tuberosity but much larger, it's called a trochanter. Okay. Uh, the trochanter is only found on the femur. So if we're looking at bones other than the femur, you'll never see trochanters, right? We only have what's called a greater and lesser trochanter on the femur. We also can have a line. Now, if you compare a crest to a line, they look very similar. A line is less pronounced. There is also a tubercle, and a tubercle is a smaller type of rounded projection or process than a tuberosity. There's also an epicondyle, epi meaning above, so this is above the condyle. We'll see that the condyle is going to be part of a joint, so an epicondyle is where we have a raised area above a condyle. A spine, this is where we have a kind of pointy or slender part that projects off of the bone, right? So a projection, something comes off the bone. This will be very clear when we talk about the vertebral column, which we commonly call the spine because of these ridges here. And we'll see those ridges are called spine, vertebral spines. Now this word process, this is the general word. This is the fallback word. The process is any bony prominence, okay? any bony part that sticks out. Okay? These would be more specific kinds. As we go through and do this, this is where if you are the type of student that you like rote memorization, rote memorization is very helpful here. Um, 
when you look at the bones, you memorize the bones, you memorize the specific parts on the bones, right? I will be not I will not be asking you to diagnose, if you will, right? Is this a tubercle or is this a tuberosity? I will give you the name of it and you should then memorize it. Okay? What's helpful though is if you keep those all kind of in the same category. So this is where muscles will attach, ligaments will attach, um, tendons will attach, depending on uh, what we're looking at. And what you can imagine is they, they have to, you can't have a tendon or a ligament attaching on a smooth surface, right? There has to be something for it to actually hold on to. Now in terms of the joints, we will spend chapter 8 looking at the joints. There are a few main terms, something called a head, when we talk about the head of a bone. This is where we have an expansion so the bone is thin, and then we have an expansion. Right? That would be the head. Think about the head of the body. Thin neck expansion. Right? That also defines then what the neck is. Then we have a facet. Facet is very important. We're going to talk about a lot of facets. Okay? A facet is a smooth, nearly flat surface. Okay? It might have a slight curve to it. And this is where we're going to see an articulation occur. Articulation means a joint. Okay? So we're going to have facets. We also then have a condyle, and we said condyle before, we have epicondyles. A condyle is a rounded projection of bone that's going to form a joint. Okay, so we're going to see a condyle, and it's going to, a condyle is going to sit into one of these depressions. And then the last thing is a ramus, okay, and a ramus is a arm-like or a branch-like projection that usually connects to another part. So those would be the lumps and the bumps, and now we have the holes. There are different ways you can have holes in the bones. Now, of course, these are not holes that are made in the bone. These are natural holes in the bone where something passes through or a depression where something sits. Okay. So we can have an, a meatus. A meatus is a canal-like passageway. So it's an opening that something passes through, and it's fairly long. Compared to the last one over here, foramen, a foramen is an opening in a bone, but it's usually short. The plural of foramen is foramina, so if you've seen that in the book. We also have a sinus. Now you've all heard the word sinus before, but a sinus is actually a space within a bone. Okay? It's enclosed within the bone, and it's actually lined with mucosal membrane. So we will talk about the paranasal sinuses, which are the four different sinuses that group around the nasal passageway, and that's what most of us, if you've experienced sinus problems, have experienced, or paranasal sinuses. Okay. Um, then we have what's called a fossa, and fossas are shallow depressions. They are more of a depression than a facet. Facet is nearly flat. A depression, right? a fossa is a deeper depression. Okay. We will see that fossas and condyles often go together. Condyle is a rounded part that forms a joint and it sits often in a fossa. Um, there's also a fissure, okay, and a fissure is a slit-like opening, right? and then I mentioned before foramen. So start looking at these terms, start figuring out what they mean as we apply those in Chapter 7 and actually look at specific bones and look at these structures. All right. <clears throat> Let's take a few minutes to look at the anatomy of bones in terms of the different bone textures. So within our bones, we have really two different types of bone. We have compact bone and spongy bone. Compact bone is just that. It is a dense outer layer of compact bone tissue. Spongy bone then, spongy bone is not squishy bone. Right? Spongy bone is bone that is a weaved look. You may also hear that weaved look. We see a honeycomb-like organization where we have spaces. The bony regions then are called trabeculae. This is where we will see red bone marrow. So this is where we have red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is that hematopoietic tissue. If we were to take a long bone, this happens to be a humerus, and we were to cut down the length of the humerus, we would expose the inner parts of the bone, and we can see both the spongy bone and we can see the um, compact bone. So let's just
kind of do a walk through the structure of a long bone. The shaft portion here, the majority of which is compact bone that has inside it this medullary cavity, that is called the diaphysis. Diaphysis is a tubular shaft. It forms the axis of the long bones. Um, it's mostly compact bone. Inside the diaphysis of long bones in adults, we do have bone marrow, but this is called yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow is predominantly fat. Okay. That is not the hematopoietic bone marrow. The hematopoietic red bone marrow would be found up here in what's called the epiphysis, plural epiphyses. So there is one on the top, and then not shown down here, we would have what's called the distal epiphysis. Okay. If we were to cut away, we'd see the same thing. This organization of spongy bone, we have an outer layer of compact bone, and then this inner layer of spongy bone. The very top surface, this is where a joint would form, and we will see that this is where the humerus would articulate with a bone called the scapula, which is your shoulder blade bone. We have a layer of hyaline cartilage is going to form the cap of that. Another important structure is right here. This is called the epiphyseal line. This is where growth occurs in long bones, and we will look at long bone growth. And we'll see that that epiphyseal line is going to be very important in how the long bones grow in children and in how growth in bones stops. So let's take a look at a little bit more of a focus in. Let's imagine that we can go in and cut a section of this out. So if we were to take a section from this top part in the epiphysis and pull it out, we would see that we have an outer layer of articular cartilage, then we have a layer of compact bone, and then we have the spongy bone. The reason this is called spongy bone upon close inspection, it looks like if you go to the grocery store and you buy a plastic sponge and look at it closely, that's what it looks like. There's spaces in between. Right? Notice there is vascularity, so we do have blood supply in bone. Right? That is a key difference between blood, I'm sorry, between bone and cartilage. Cartilage has no blood, but bone has lots of blood. Now, if we were to take a section here of this diaphysis and focus in on it, we will see that the diaphysis is the majority of it is compact bone. Surrounding this, we have something called periosteum. Right? Peri meaning surrounding, osteo being the word root for anything having to do with bone. So the periosteum is the connective tissue that is going to surround the bone. There is a fine layer in here called the endosteum. Right? This is the internal bone layer. You will notice that there are blood vessels that are going to come in and they will actually penetrate through this compact bone. The periosteum is going to be very important. It is also a double layered protective membrane. Um, the outer part is a dense fibrous connective tissue. It does have a fairly white appearance. The inner layer that faces the bone surface is where we're going to have an osteogenic layer. Osteogenic meaning creating new bone. So we will see both osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are the cells that can make new bone. And osteoclasts. And we haven't seen osteoclasts yet, but these are, bone, these are cells that can break bone down. These osteoclasts and osteoblasts are going to be very important in how bone grows initially and how it heals or remodels. There is a good degree of um, blood supply. We see nerve fibers or innervation. We'll see lymphatic vessels. Okay. These all enter the bone via what are called nutrient foramina. Right? These are small openings where blood supply can pass through. The periosteum is going to be connected to the underlying bone by these structures called Sharpie's fibers. Um, and I did mention the term endosteum is then on the inside part of the bone. Now that is, those diaphyses and, and epiphyses are what we see in long bones, but in short bones, regular bones, flat bones, we're not going to have that same organization. What we will see instead with short, irregular, or flat bones is we will see periosteum covered compact bone on the outside, 
On the inside, we will see spongy bone. Um, there are no diaphyses or epiphyses. Here, the bone marrow will be that, t that red bone marrow, the hematopoietic red bone marrow for the most part. And we see that between the trabeculae. So here's a picture. Right? This would be a section taken from what's called the parietal bone of the skull. It is a typical flat bone. We have an outer layer of compact bone, outer layer of compact bone. And then in between here, we have the spongy bone. And in this call, we call this diploe. In terms of the hematopoietic tissue or the red bone marrow, in infants, in very, very small children, it is found in the medullary cavities of the long bones. It's found within the short bones, flat bones. But as we grow, that red bone marrow gets replaced by yellow bone marrow, which is not hematopoietic, so that the only red bone marrow that you'd find in an adult would be within the flat bones, okay, and also in the heads of the femur and humerus is where the most of it would be concentrated. If you have ever seen anybody, whether in real life or on TV, who needs to either donate bone marrow or have a bone marrow test, they go in through the hip into the head of the femur right, to either extract bone marrow or donate bone marrow. That's where the bone marrow is located. Right? And that would only really be um, of consequence if you had somebody who had one of the particular kinds of blood cancers where the cancer originates in the bone marrow. All right. so. <clears throat> Looking at the microscopic structure of bones, we're going to start off looking at compact bones specifically. This has a very particular way that it's organized, and the reason it has this organization is to make it strong. Bones are weight-bearing. They have to be strong. They have to be able to withstand pressure changes. They have to be able to withstand weight-bearing. What we're going to see is we have this structural unit that's called an osteon. The osteon works all together in something called the Haversian system. And we're going to see different components here. So we're going to look at something called lamella, uh, central or Haversian canals, and Volkmann's canals. Um, please remember these, the key word of osteocytes, which are the mature bone cells. These are going to be the cells that we'll see within this compact bone system. <clears throat> we also have lacunae. Lacunae we mentioned in chapter 4 when we looked at bone as a tissue, also when we talked about um, cartilage. Lacunae are small cavities in the bone. You can think about these as the little houses or little spots where the osteocytes are going to live. Okay. The other important thing are what are called canaliculi. That's plural. Singular is canaliculus. And canaliculi, these are going to be hair-like canals that will connect one lacuna to another lacuna. That, thereby connecting the different osteocytes. So even though we are going to look at this very strong uh, tissue with a very solid matrix, there are little connections from cell to cell. So if we take a look over here on the mature bone, this would be if we took a section out of our compact bone, this inner area here, where we have spongy bone, this is where we would see the central canal. So we'd be working from the central canal outward. On the outermost part, we have that periosteum. Remember, periosteum is that dense connective tissue. Um, it's osteogenic, or bone creating on the inner layer. These circular components here, these are all going to be what we call the osteons. Okay? The osteon really is several smaller concentric rings filling in, kind of like nesting dolls. Each of those rings, like the rings of a tree, those are called lamellae. Um, in between each of these rings, we're going to see little spots. So we can actually take a chunk out of an osteon, and we can focus in on it. And that's what we're focusing here. Right? So what we see, each of these rings then is called a lamella, plural lamellae. The spaces where the cells are, these are called lacuna. These cells then are the osteocytes, so these are the mature bone cells. And you can see the cells are able to connect with one another through these tiny little canals called canaliculi. Now in the center of each osteon is going to be the central canal. Those central canals run up and down, if you will, in the center of the osteon, and that's where we'll see blood vessels and nerves. 
Then connecting each of those central canals, we have these Volkmann's canals or perforating canals. And these are going to allow for connection from the major blood vessels coming in to each of the central canals. Right? So you could think of these as the main roads or the main streets, and these would be like the main avenues, right? if you think about this like a city. And then each of the little tiny hairs are like the side streets or the alleyways. Right? So we have everything all connected. These blood vessels will also go into the medullary cavity, the center of the bone. Please do not confuse the central canal, which we see at the center of every osteon, with the medullary cavity of the entire bone. Now, there are some lamellae that are not involved in an actual osteon. We have those around the edge, so they're around the circumference of the bone, so they're called circumferential lamellae. Because these oste osteons are circular, you can imagine if you have a whole bunch of circles together, there's going to be tiny spaces in between. Okay? Those tiny spaces are filled with little lamellae that are called interstitial. The word interstitial means between the spaces. Okay. So those are the different types of um, structures that we would see. Now if we look at this under the microscope, right, we saw a slide like this uh, in the tissue chapter. Now we're going to take a look at it and look at the different parts. Rather than just saying, oh yeah, that's bone. Now we have to take this and translate this, compare it back to that diagram that we just saw so we can label all the parts. Okay. So to get our bearings, here is the central canal. Okay. That is the centermost part of an osteon. The osteon then would be this entire circular region. Okay. Now this is not a complete or perfect circle. We don't expect perfect circles, but you can see it's circular in nature. It's made, of, of, made up of rings. It almost looks like if you cut through a tree, you can see these rings. Each of these dark spots, these small dark spots here, shown with the pointer, these are the lacunae where we would have the osteocytes. You can just make out these little hair-like structures. Those are the canaliculi. Over here, you do see some of those interstitial lamellae that are occurring between this osteon, this osteon, and this osteon. Okay. So here are some of those interstitial lamellae. Now, this isn't under a terribly high magnification, so you will be able to see this under the microscope. Okay. You should be able to identify the different parts of this. Now, when we take a look at these osteons, these osteons have a very important structure. Right? These are connective tissues. We said that in connective tissues, we have fibers. We don't really see the fibers in bone, simply because bone has that hard, calcified matrix. But there are collagen fibers. And the way the collagen fibers run, they actually run in an alternating pattern. So <clears throat> if you imagine an osteon as, say, a PVC pipe, Inside that pipe, you have a smaller pipe, and then a smaller pipe, and a smaller pipe, and a smaller pipe, and a smaller pipe. Smaller pipe right? You could imagine that you could pull those out so you could look at each lamella. You could look at each layer. As you do that, each layer will alternate the direction that the collagen fibers are oriented. So here, they're running counterclockwise. Here, they're running clockwise. Here, they're running counterclockwise. So having that alternating counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise pattern, this is going to give each osteon incredible tensile strength. If there is a twisting motion in the clockwise direction, okay, all those fibers that go in that direction will resist that twist. If there is a twisting motion in the opposite direction, you'll have protection in the opposite direction. Right? So this is really kind of doubling up the strength of your osteon. The osteon is important because within it we have blood vessels. We also have nerve fibers. This is why broken bones hurt. Broken bones hurt because within every single osteon, we have blood supply. We have nerves. When we break that bone, we break those blood vessels. So this helps us to resist twisting forces. And you can imagine simple movements apply twisting forces on your bones. Now, with the entirety of the bone, we don't just have one osteon. We will have hundreds of osteons, each with this organization, really increasing the strength of bone. Now, the way bone is formed, we have different cells that are involved. Um, 
following with the same kind of organization we saw looking at cartilage, now we have osteo as our important prefix. Okay. So osteo having to do with bone, and the blast, these are the bone forming cells. Osteocytes, then, those are the mature bone cells. Here we have osteoclasts. Now, osteoclasts, these are going to be cells that can break down bone. They actually are going to resorb the matrix of bone. Okay. These are going to be cells that are going to break down bone in order to pull the calcium out. There's another important organic component of bone, and that's called osteoid. Now, osteoid is the unmineralized part of the bone matrix. Okay. By unmineralized, I mean the part that is not the calcium and the phosphate. Okay. Um, the, those are considered minerals, so this is unmineralized. This is where we're going to see the organic part of the bone matrix. Okay. Organic, think back to chapter 2. Organic chemistry are those things dealing with proteins, carbohydrates, right? So what we're looking at here are proteoglycans and glycoproteins, which are proteins and carbohydrates together, and then collagen, and collagen is a protein. So that's what this osteoid is. It's organic bone matter. The inorganic component of bone matter, this is where we see that mineralization. So we have mineral salts, also called hydroxyapatites. This is really about 65% of the mass of bones. Most of it is going to be calcium phosphate. Now we said this is a mineral salt. If you think back to chapter 2, we said salts are where you have ionic compounds that don't have H plus and OH minus. So calcium is a positive ion. Phosphate would be a negative ion. So calcium phosphate is a salt. This mineralization, the addition of these calcium phosphates, are what are going to give bone its hardness and its resistance to compression. Right? So this is why growing up you're told to drink milk to get calcium to make your bones strong. Now we're going to take some time to look at bone development. Right? where bone comes from. And we're going to see that depending on the bone we're talking about, there are two main processes that will lead to bone development. Um, the term osteogenesis, anytime you see something genesis, right? osteogenesis is the creation of bone. The word genesis means the Ossification then is the process of a changing a pre-existing tissue into a bone tissue. Now this is going to occur, and we'll start off looking at the formation of the bony skeleton in embryos. Okay. So this is really where we first see bone developing. It's a really interesting process how it occurs. It will continue as your bones grow into early adulthood, and it will also occur throughout life as bones change thickness or remodel or they repair. And so we're going to look at this in three different ways. So let's start off looking at the formation of the bony skeleton uh, in an embryo. There are two main kinds of ossification that we're going to see. The first is called intramembranous ossification. And if you look at that word, intramembranous means within a membrane. So here we're going to see the bone developing from a fibrous membrane. The other kind is endochondral ossification. Endo meaning inside and chondral, meaning cartilage. So here the bone is going to form by replacing a hyaline cartilage bone model, if you will. And we will see that these two types of ossification are going to occur depending on the type of bone that we're forming. Right? They're going to produce two very different looking bones. So we will start off with intramembranous ossification. This is where we're going to have the formation of the flat bones of the skull the clavicles. Here we're going to start off with a connective tissue membrane and that is going to be that mesenchymal me uh, membrane, right? That mesenchymal cells. If you remember connective tissue, chapter 4, all connective tissues <coughs> come from mesenchyme. Right? Mesenchyme is that embryonic precursor. So the way this will occur now, this is occurring in the stages um, in the development of the brain. Uh, not the brain. Mm, the skull. <laughs> yeah. What we have is you can imagine that there is a precursor tissue that is mesenchyme. 
Throughout that, there will be these mesenchymal cells, and these have the ability to change to go down one of those four paths. Right? These are going to go down the bone path, so these are going to become osteoblasts. What will occur then is some of these mesenchymal cells will change into osteoblasts. And what osteoblasts do is they have the ability to produce osteoid. Okay? Osteoid, that is that organic precursor to bone, right, where we have proteoglycans and glycoproteins and collagen. This is going to create what's called an ossification center. Right? It is a point where ossification is going to begin. These osteoblasts are going to start laying down osteoid, laying down osteoid, laying down osteoid, and they're going to start making a little spot of bone. That ossification center is where the bone is going to start. Now, sometimes some of those osteoblasts become trapped within that bone. When they get trapped within that bone, they're trapped within a lacuna. They then mature, and they become an osteocyte. Now they no longer can lay down new bone. What they can do instead is they can support the bone. Now, all along the edges, we still have osteoblasts that are laying down osteoid. So this, from this center, the bone is going to grow out. And it's going to replace that fibrous membrane, creating our initial bone. As time goes on, this is where we're going to see the look of what's called woven bone, or we've previously called it spongy bone. So once we have this woven bone, we start to see the beginning of periosteum. Periosteum, then, that is that outer layer. And the, where the periosteum comes from, this mesenchymal cell, these can also change to become dense regular connective tissue. Right? Remember that is that connective tissue proper line, so they become fibroblasts. So this will form the periosteum. Now the final point of this, right, and this is kind of where the end point is. Remember, this is making flat bones from the skull. Flat bones have a thin layer of compact bone, then they have that woven or spongy bone, and then on the other side they have more compact bone. And that's what we're going to see here. <coughs> so. Here we have the fibrous periosteum with that inner osteogenic layer where we still have osteoblasts. This will be our area where we have compact bone. The inner part then is where we're going to have um, the woven bone or the spongy bone, so the trabeculae and the space is called the diplo. This is where we'll see red bone marrow. Other side, more compact bone, osteoblasts, periosteum. This is exactly what we saw previously in terms of how flat bones look. Right? They have that kind of uh, borders on the side and then spongy bone in the middle. Now this will, con this will occur throughout um, the, the formation of the different skull bones. Later today and in lab we will look at the actual bones of the skull and we'll look at a fetal skull and we're going to see how this creates the individual bones in the skull. Now, the other kind of <clears throat> ossification that we need to talk about in terms of embryonic ossification is endochondral ossification. Um, this is where bone is going to replace models um, that are actually made of hyaline cartilage. Then, in order to do that, they're going to have to break down the hyaline cartilage. Now, there's benefits to starting off with hyaline cartilage before bone. Hyaline cartilage is cartilage, so it can grow, it can change shape. Bone can't. Once you make bone, bone really doesn't have a lot of ability to change shape. The first step that's going to occur is there will be ossification around the edges, and that's called a bone collar. Once that ossification has occurred, we will see the center part here, we see a primary ossification center. So here we're going to have a similar thing happen where we're going to have osteoblasts forming. Those osteoblasts are going to create osteoid. That osteoid is going to start laying down bone matrix. As this occurs, it's actually going to push the hyaline cartilage out of its way. Okay. It's not necessarily changing the hyaline cartilage, though that can occur. Here we're actually going to see a push, and the hyaline cartilage is going to get pushed away. As that occurs then, as that pushing is occurring, it's going to actually increase the length of this. Now, it can't increase the side because of this bone collar. The bone collar on the side will force the hyaline cartilage to move up and down, thereby increasing the length. Right? There will also be some deterioration of the cartilage matrix as this spongy bone is being formed. As time continues, this will actually create a cavity, which will become that medullary cavity. Okay? 
So you can see we see the opening occurring here. This early on, we're going to start seeing vascularity. Right? We're going to start seeing the invasion of this bone with blood vessels. As this continues, we will eventually have the bone reaching out and hitting the bone collar. And at that point, the side-to-side -side growth has stopped, and the continued growth will just be in length, pushing and deteriorating the hyaline cartilage out. We'll then have secondary ossification centers that are going to form, and those will form on the two ends, which will become the epiphyses, right? This is creating the diaphysis or the shaft. Until finally, we have a bone that looks, for all intents and purposes, quite similar to what an adult bone would look like. Okay. This is, of course, for long bones. So we have the diaphysis, where we have compact bone around the edge. We have an open medullary cavity. We have a little bit of spongy bone at the end of the diaphysis, and then we have this area here that remains cartilage. Right? Where this ossification center and this ossification center meet, there's a little bit of cartilage left over. This is going to be extremely important. This is the epiphyseal plate, also known as the growth plate. And when we look at how bones grow, how long bones grow, that's where growth will occur from. The other little bit of remaining cartilage is along the top and bottom, and this will become the articular cartilage. And that articular cartilage is going to be very important in the joints. We see the same organization down here on the bottom where we have the epiphysis, and then here we have the epiphyseal plate. Now overall, this endochondral ossification is what would occur in all of our long bones. Notice that there is blood supply very, very early on. And in the embryo, we would have red blood cells being formed within the long bones. By the time we get to an adult stage, the um, only place we'd still see that red blood cell formation going on, the hematopoiesis going on, would be in the heads. When we talked about embryonic ossification, this is showing you an embryonic or a fetal skeleton. Here we can see some of the different areas. So within the skull, this is where we'll see intramembranous ossification occurring. This intramembranous ossification would occur in the different bones that we're going to see form the skull. Okay, this is called the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the occipital bone. Okay. The long bone, such as the humerus, the uh, radius and ulnar, the fema, the tibia, the fibula, these are going to occur through endochondral ossification. We will take a look at a fetal skull model in lab and we will see how when a fetus is born and becomes a baby um, how these bones are not actually fully formed okay, and they're not fully connected yet however most of the bones of the body are there they're fully formed they just need to grow now so that's basically embryonic development up until birth when embryos become fetuses and fetuses become babies right when they're born um, they have most of the bones, with the exception of things that are called sesamoid bones, which would be like the patella. Um, once birth occurs, we then have growth, specifically growth in the long bones. There is some growth in the flat bones and the irregular bones, but it's much less. The majority of the growth we see occurs in the long bones. And this is where things get a little bit more complicated, because we have that epiphyseal plate, which is still cartilage. So we're going to see that in that plate, the cartilage is going to grow. The cartilage is going to grow, and as it grows, it's going to change to bone. And that's going to lay down more bone to increase the length of the bone. Um, the way this would occur, um, the cartilage that's on the side of the epiphyseal plate closest to the epiphysis is relatively inactive. Right? Now, I can't say top or bottom because bones have an epiphysis on both sides. Right? So closer to the epiphysis really is inactive. The cartilage that faces the shaft of the bone, this is where we're going to have the growth occurring. That's where we're going to have dividing cells and the growth occurring. Um, when you take a look at that, if you were to section that growth plate, we can see different zones, right? What are called the growth zones, transformation zones, and osteogenic zones. Um, in the growth zones, the cartilage cells are going to divide. They undergo mitosis. Remember, mitosis is the process of a cell dividing. When they divide, they then each can start laying down their own cartilage and will actually push apart. And that will cause the epiphysis to grow and push away from the shaft. 
as that's occurring, we have the transformation zone. Right? This is where the cells are going to get bigger. They will enlarge. Then the matrix becomes calcified. Once that happens, those cartilage cells start to die. The matrix begins to deteriorate. And then it's going to change to bone. Okay? This is where we have what's called the osteogenic zone. So let's take a look at this. If we were to take a bone of a growing individual and section right along the epiphyseal plate, okay, we would see right here, take a section out and focus in on it. What we would see, we could see these different zones. Okay. <clears throat> so towards the epiphysis, okay, up here on top, that's our resting or our quiescent zone. The word quiescent, quiescent means resting. Then below it, we have the growth or the pro proliferation zone. Okay. This is where we're going to have the cartilage cells undergoing mitosis. So we're going to see larger cells dividing in two. Okay. Then we're going to see what's called the hypertrophic zone. Okay. This is another part of the growth zone. This is where the older cartilage cells are going to enlarge. They're going to grow. They're going to spread. And you can actually see a difference in the size of the cells from here to here. This is the boundary where we start to see calcification occurring. Remember, the matrix of cartilage is very different than the matrix of bone. And the main difference is the lack of those minerals, right? the minerals being the calcium phosphates. So mineralization is that hardening. And then at the end here, at the bottom, we have the ossification zone. Okay? This is where the new bone is going to form. What this does is you can imagine it's going to increase the length of the bones. But can you imagine that if this occurred just along that layer, eventually you'd have a bone with a very short shaft and really, really long, tall epiphyses. Does that make sense? Okay. So in addition to growth occurring in a linear fashion, we have to see some remodeling. Okay. So the growth in length, that's going to occur at the epiphyseal plate. All right. The cartilage will grow, will be replaced by bone. In order for the bone to have the proper shape, though, we have to see remodeling going on. Okay? You can only add stuff on top so much. You have to also then change things. So a couple things have to happen. Not only does the bone have to get longer, it also has to get wider. But we don't want it to just get wider without changing that inner space. Okay? We have to increase the opening of the medullary cavity. So we want the bone to do this. Okay, so that we can increase the overall circumference, but maintain the thickness. We don't want it to get too overly thick. Otherwise, we'd have nearly solid bones. Okay. That's going to occur through remodeling. So if you take a look, this is a simplified bone. Okay. Growth is going to lead to an increase in length. The cartilage would grow. The cartilage gets replaced by bone. There are two main areas. This is where we'll focus on. This is the area of the epiphyseal plate. This is where the diaphysis meets the epiphysis. Okay. So what would happen if there was no remodeling occurring? This region here, the epiphysis, would just go straight up. Okay. If that's all that was going on. We'd still have a very narrow bone. Okay. And it would just go straight up and up and up and up. And that would not work. Okay. We'd completely change the mechanics of the bone. So what we have to do is we need to increase the length, but we also have to try and maintain the shape while increasing the diameter of the shaft, because otherwise the shaft would be too skinny to support the length of the bone. So this growth is going on, and we're also then going to see remodeling. What remodeling is, is as this is growing, some of this area here will be removed, right? and that's called resorption, and the cells that do that are the osteoclasts. Once that occurs, we will also see some removal occurring here, in this region here, the bone is being resorbed, and it's going to be laid down here through what's called appositional growth. Now we've talked about appositional growth in cartilage. Appositional growth is growth from the outside, where you have either, um, you have osteogenic cells in the periosteum that are going to lay down new bone. So what we see is as this bone grows, <clears throat> this little red dotted line shows you where the bone was. So it has gotten taller. We've maintained the proper shape of the head and the neck of the bone. We've increased the overall width of the shaft, but without making the bone collar too thick. Right? So we've taken away, shaved away a little bit from the inside, and laid it down on the outside. But we maintain the overall shape. Okay? And
And that's how remodeling occurs. And that has to occur so that we can take a little baby femur and make it into a big person femur. Okay. All right. Now this occurs, growth occurs normally um, from infancy through childhood up until what we consider adulthood. Um, the, the growth of the epiphyseal plate for the most part early on in prepubescent individuals is stimulated by growth hormone. As we switch from prepubescence to pubescence, we then see a switch to a responsiveness to the sex steroids or testosterone and estrogen. And this is where we're going to see our sex-based differences in growth. Okay. Um, when you have an adolescent growth spurt, this is usually where you know, a young, young man or young woman will grow like a good amount over, say, a summer. Um, here's where we see the difference between masculinization and feminization of the skeleton. If you look at little boys and girls that are, say, three, four, or five years old, aside from clothing and hair, you really can't tell the difference between the shape of a body in a little boy and a little girl. Okay? But if you look at a 15-year-old, you usually can. That is because as we develop, as we go through puberty, the bones then start to change the way they're forming. We're going to see there are distinct differences between a male skeleton and a female skeleton, um, having to do with the thickness of the bones, the overall height, the shape of the pelvis, the shape of the facial structure. Right? And those differences really come out during puberty. Now, at some point, those sex hormones are also then going to switch this off. In females, this usually occurs about 16, 17 years of age. Males, it's usually a little later, 17 to 19, 20, is when you stop growing. Okay. Um, for some people, it's earlier. Some people, it's later. Okay. What occurs when you stop growing is that epiphyseal plate fuses. Okay. So that cartilage then stops becoming able to divide, and that growth plate closes. And that's when you no longer grow, in height at least. One part of the way we're going to see bones both growing and then later on healing has to do with this remodeling. This is going to be a really important part. Um, so when we're looking at this, we have these remodeling units. Okay. Um, and this is where we're going to see an interaction between osteoblasts, which lay down new bone, and osteoclasts, which resorb or break down the bone. Okay. Um, when this is going to occur, we can see this both at the periosteal and the endosteal surfaces. So the periosteal surface, that's the part of the bone that faces out towards the periosteum. The endosteal surface, that would be the part of the bone that faces in towards that medullary cavity, right, where we have the lining or the endosteum. Um, what allows for bone deposition to occur, we need certain things of that to occur. right? <clears throat> We need certain vitamins. Right? Vitamin D is a big one, but we also need things like vitamin C and vitamin A. Those will help deposition to occur. Um, you do need an amount of protein because in addition to those inorganic minerals in bone, we also have that organic matter, the glycoproteins, pro proteoglycans, the collagen. Okay. Uh, we also need to have those minerals, calcium, phosphorus, and also magnesium and manganese. Right? These also are going to work as kind of cofactors to allow that mineralization to occur. Um, there's also an important enzyme that's called alkaline phosphatase. We know it's an enzyme because it ends in ASC. Okay? And that's what's actually going to allow that phosphate and the calcium to be put into the bone. Now you'll see bone deposition or the hardening of bone and the laying down of bone wherever bone may be injured, okay, whenever we need it to be remodeled, or where added strength is needed. So earlier in the chapter we talked about those lumps and bumps of bones, and we said that some of those were places where tendons connect or muscles connect. That's where we're going to see some of this bone deposition occurring. You can look at bone and see where new matrix has been deposited. Um, you may be able to see an osteoid seam or a calcification front. And this is basically, if you look at where a bone has been repaired or has changed or has grown, you can see just the traces. Now, when I say you, I don't necessarily mean you and I. Right? You as in a trained medical professional, right? People who look at x-rays. And that's what they do, and that's what they're trained to do. Can look at an x-ray of a bone and tell exactly where it was broken and when it was broken, usually, within certain limits. Okay. Uh, it's the same thing if you've ever had to like repair a wall. Right? You 
somebody punches out a hole in your wall, so you have to cut out the sheetrock, put a new piece of sheetrock in, spackle it, paint it. No matter how good of a job you do, if you look carefully enough, you're going to see those seams. You're going to see those marks. Same thing in bone. Um, the way this occurs, again, we have to see that resorption occurring. Um, so these osteoclasts, these bone resorbing cells, these are going to actually create little grooves or bays called resorption bays. And the way they do this, right, they're not breaking down the other cells. They're breaking down the matrix. So they have enzymes within their lysosomes. Think back to chapter 3. Right? And those lysosomes are going to release those enzymes, and they're going to actually digest the organic matrix, the organic parts. To get the minerals out of the matrix, they're going to use acids. Okay? Acids will actually take those calcium salts, and convert them into soluble forms. So we now have the calcium ion, the phosphate ion, in a way they can go back into solution. And they're actually going to get pulled out of this hard form and into a, liquid, a form that can go into liquid, and they'll be moved then into the blood usually. Um, when that matrix is dissolved by the osteoclast, the osteoclast will then take that and actually transcytose it across their cell and secrete it into the interstitial fluid in the blood. Right? So these osteoclasts, you could almost imagine that they are digesting and breaking down the bone and then sucking it up into them and then spitting it out the other side. Right? In a crude way, that's kind of what they're doing. Now there's a reason that osteoclasts do this, and osteoclasts are always doing this in small amounts. Okay? We need calcium, and I've mentioned this before, casually, we need calcium in its ionic form within the body so that we can have transmission of nerve impulses, and we will see that in chapter 11. For muscle contraction, we will see that in chapter 9. For blood coagulation, um, for how the glands and the nerve cells work, and for cell division. Right? Calcium is an important component for all of those to occur. So we have the bones. Yes, the calcium makes the bones hard, but the bones really are acting as a storage site for calcium. So when it's time to pull that calcium out, that's what those osteoclasts are going to do. Now, there are hormonal controls that are going to tell the body when to do this. Okay. Now, there are two loops, and these loops kind of feed off of one another. Um, we're going to see that we're going to see a kind of a classic negative feedback loop here. Um, We'll look first at the hormonal mechanisms, and then we'll talk a little bit about physical mechanisms that are going to affect this as well. So the hormonal mechanism is going to involve something called calcitonin. Okay. Calcitonin is going to be released by the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is located kind of just below your throat. Okay, is where you see the thyroid gland. Um, we also have something called the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland is located inside the thyroid gland. And the parathyroid gland is going to release a hormone called parathyroid hormone, or PTH. Okay. These will be triggered by differing levels of calcium ion within the blood. So let's take a look at this in the same kind of way. Think back to chapter 1 when we talked about negative feedback loops. Okay. We start off... We want to have a homeostatic level of calcium in the blood somewhere in this realm over here. Right? Um, <clears throat> if we start to have lots of calcium in the blood, okay, let's say you go out and you go on a total milk binge and you drink like six big glasses of calcium milk, right? Your body's going to want to take that milk and store it, right? We don't. I'm not that milk. <laughs> take the calcium from that milk and store it. Okay, that's actually leading to an imbalance. We now have very high levels of calcium in the blood. That's going to send a message to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is going to sense that high level of calcium, and it is going to secrete calcitonin, and it's going to decrease the levels of PTH coming out of the parathyroid. What calcitonin is going to do, it is going to stimulate that calcium to be deposited as a salt into the bone. Okay. So it's pulling that soluble calcium ion out of solution, putting it with phosphate ion, making calcium phosphate, put in its salt form, and putting it into the bone, mineralizing the bone. Okay. Now this is acting as a storage. It's getting the calcium out of the blood and putting it in a storage. And what that does is it brings us back into homeostasis. Now the opposite side can occur. 
let's say you have a diet that's relatively low in calcium and you do a lot of exercise, um, you're doing lots of muscle contraction, right? Maybe you've just cut yourself and you've bled a lot, right? So you've basically used up the amount of calcium flowing around. So you see that there is an imbalance where we now have a low level of calcium in the blood. All sorts of things can lead to this. Now, we see the parathyroid glands, which are located here in the back of the thyroid. These are going to release PTH, or parathyroid hormone. And that parathyroid hormone, as it is increasing, it is going to stimulate osteoclasts. Now, these are osteoclasts. We've mentioned them before. These are fairly large cells. Um, these will, along that layer of the periosteum where they are hanging out, they will secrete those different enzymes, they will break down the organic part of the matrix, they will also then release acid to break down the mineral part of the matrix. They'll then suck that back up and transcytose it out and basically spit it into the blood. Once that calcium is taken out of its salt form, out of its calcium phosphate form, put back into calcium ion form and put into the blood, we'll now see the calcium levels going back up to homeostatic levels in the blood. Now, this may occur on a daily basis in normal individuals, right? We always have this balance. Again, homeostasis is about maintaining a balance. Now, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong here. Um, if you have either disease of the thyroid or the parathyroid, you can see problems with this occurring. Um, and we will talk about one of those problems in a few minutes. All right. The other way that we see bone change, this is a response to mechanical stress. So there's this concept in physics called Wolf's Law, um, and this has to do with where bones grow and remodel um, is going to be due to the forces placed upon it. Right? Bones are not all going to be the exact same shape. We will look at bones. We talked about those lumps and bumps, those different bony projections. Right? We see those projections sometimes simply because of the forces that are placed upon bones. Um, we are going to look at where bones are the thickest, where they are the strongest. So for long bones, like say the femur, which is the bone of the thigh, the thickest part is going to be midway along the shaft. Okay? That's because that's where the bone is most likely to break, so that's where it needs to be strongest. Right? Imagine if you're trying to break a foot-long twig in your hands. You're not going to break it at one end or the other end, you're going to snap it right in the middle. That's where it's the easiest point to snap. So you could imagine the same thing with a long bone like the femur. If you want to snap it, the weakest point would be in the middle. So the bone has developed, so the thickest point is the middle, so now you have equal along the entire length. If you look at stress placed on a bone, pulling on a bone, we will also see increased bone mass there. Um, so we're going to see trabeculae that are going to form along lines of stress. We're going to see large bony projections forming where muscles attach. This will be things like the greater and lesser trochanter that we will see in the femur. Uh, the femur. Looking at, this is the femur. The femur is the bone of the thigh. Okay. This undergoes a lot of stress. Right? This really transfers all of the body weight to the legs. The thickest point okay, over here, we're going to see that if we load our body weight here, we have this curve region. Okay, so that we have compression here and tension on this side. What that allows for, that allows for this to be transferred much better than if this was a straight up and down bone. Okay? So we see this thickening in here, okay? and then this curve. And that's going to be mostly due to mechanical stress. Now for anyone who um, is into physical fitness, right, one of the best things you can do to strengthen your bones is to do uh, what's called weight-bearing exercises. Okay? So if you do lots of walking, right, your bones actually become stronger because they bear the weight. Right? It's the one advantage that people with higher body mass have over people with much smaller body mass. People with higher body mass tend to have stronger bones, right, because they're carrying around more body mass. Um, one of the, I don't know if anyone knows this or anyone has ever, like as a kid, was interested in astronauts and things like that. People who go into space and they have to withstand weightlessness for long periods of time, their bones break down under very short periods of time. When they undergo weightlessness and they don't have that weight against their bones, their bones actually start to break down. Right? The astronauts have a very limited lifespan in terms of how long they can actually go up into space. And then their bones become very, very, very brittle. All right, so let's take a look at bone breaking. Okay. 
Um, we have different types of fractures. These fractures are classified by uh, where the bone ends are after the break, how complete is the break, um, what is the orientation of the break along the axis of the bone, um, and whether or not the bones penetrate the skin. I do have some x-rays that we'll show up here. We have some others in lab that we'll take a look at. <clears throat> the first way to classify is whether or not the bones retain their normal position at the end of the break okay, or if they come apart. So this would be non-displaced versus displaced. So if you have a fracture where the fracture goes through but the bones retain their normal orientation, then that is non-displaced. If the bones somehow come out of alignment, that is displaced. Incomplete versus complete fracture. Um, if a bone breaks all the way through, that is complete. If it only breaks part way through, that is an incomplete fracture. There's also something called a linear fracture, and that's when the fracture occurs along the length of the bone. It can be incomplete or complete. Um, a transverse fracture, this is when the fracture is perpendicular to the long axis, so it's kind of the opposite of linear, where you break along the cross section of the bone. Uh, and then you have an open or a compound fracture. This is when the bone ends become displaced, so you have a complete fracture that becomes displaced and they penetrate out the skin. A simple fracture is when the bones do not penetrate out the skin. Now a compound fracture is extremely problematic for a lot of reasons. Number one, the bones have to be put back in place. Number two, there's huge amounts of soft tissue damage when this occurs. Number three, that somewhat sterile environment within the bone, within the periosteum, has now completely been ruptured and open. Right? So there's a huge amount of possibility of infection. All right, so three more kinds of fractures that you might see. Um, when you have a bone that fractures into multiple pieces, um, uh, that's usually what you see in the elderly. Sometimes you see it in the break in things like the head of the humerus, where the bone will break in several pieces. That's usually when there needs to be surgical repair, things like plates put in or screws put in. Um, a spiral fracture, a spiral fracture is where the bone is twisted and the break occurs in many planes in the spiral staircase way around the bone. Okay. Then we have a depressed fracture. This is where you have a bone that's sitting, on a, sitting around something, usually like the skull, and the bone gets broken inward. Okay. Um, that's slightly different than a compressed fracture. In a compressed fracture, the bone is crushed. And we'll look at the difference between a depressed and a compressed fracture. Now, two that are important <clears throat> in children is an epiphyseal break. Okay, this is a break into what's called the growth plate or the epiphyseal line. That's where we have that area that grows. If a break breaks into that, when remodeling occurs, you can see changes in the growth patterns. Uh, this is when you, if you have a small child who breaks an arm or a leg and it goes into the growth plate, um, they're very concerned about the growth being uneven in the two bones. The other thing is in young children that have their bones are thinner um, and not quite as hard and they can get what's called a green stick fracture. If you imagine going out to a live tree, cutting a branch off and then trying to snap a live branch, it will snap on the far side and bend on the close side. Right? It's like a green stick, a live branch. And that's what will happen in a very thin, fit, softer bone like in a child. So they will sometimes not have a complete break, but a partially broken, what's called a green stick fracture. So let's just take a look at some of these. Uh, here is a comminuted fracture. This is what we see in the elderly. We have multiple pieces over here. Okay. Uh, this would be a compression fracture where the bone has become crushed. We see this often in vertebrae. This is a spiral fracture. This is that common sports injury. You can see that it's broken in several planes across. This would be an epiphyseal break. The break actually goes up and into the epiphyseal line. This can be problematic because as healing is occurring, we're not going to see growth occurring properly. This would be a depressed fracture where an area of the bone has been depressed downwards. This is usually what you see in skull injuries. And this is a green stick fracture. It's going to be an incomplete fracture. But what's different than a normal incomplete fracture is we have bending on this side. Okay. And this is usually what we see in children where you have the flexible. 
All right. <clears throat> so let's take a little bit about healing, how bone fractures heal. Right. Now, this is, of course, assuming that when the bone breaks, it's put back and it's not going to be displaced. If anyone has ever had a displaced fracture, the first thing that has to be done is the bone has to be set. So if the bone is out of alignment, the bone has to be put back in alignment. Um, bones will heal out of alignment. Okay. It takes a lot longer, right? and then they're much more likely to break. Um, so bones, if you've ever had a bone that started to heal improperly, then they have to re-break it to put it back in. Right? Pretty, pretty horrific stuff. Okay. Once the bone is held back in place, if this did not break the periosteum on the outside here, right, the first thing you get is a hematoma, and this is where you get the pain of a break. Right? When the bone breaks, those blood vessels break, a hematoma is basically an area that has fill, filled up with blood. That Periosteum does not expand very well, so you get a lot of pressure. And this is where the pain of breaks really comes from. Um, we get a lot of inflammation. So this is really the first step. This is, this is when you first, after you first break your bone. Um, as the healing occurs, the first thing that's going to occur is you're going to get a fibrocartilaginous callus. Okay. The callus is a kind of protective and first level of connection. Um, you'll start to see blood vessels reforming. Right? You have to have blood supply going. The blood supply is necessary to take away any extra fluid and also for any um, debris to be taken away and broken down. A few days after the fracture, you'll start to see the beginning of this knitting back together. Um, and you start seeing the cleanup of the debris by the phagocytic cells, right, which come in on the blood supply. What is going to occur here is you're going to see both osteoblasts and fibroblasts um, moving over to start reconstructing the bone. The osteoblast can lay down new bone. The fibroblasts can lay down new connective tissue. Right. The fibroblasts are going to secrete the collagen fibers, and those are going to be the first things that connect the two in ends of bones. Right? They're going to kind of scotch tape the bones together. The osteoblasts then are going to come in and they're going to start forming spongy bone. Right? They're going to start actually connecting these over. Um, as this is going to occur, you're going to see that it's going to be thicker initially than the bone that had been broken. Okay? We call this then the bony callus. So we have throughout here an area of spongy bone. Right? It doesn't have that same tight organization quite yet. Um, this callus can occur somewhere between three and four weeks after injury, right? but it's not fully healed somewhere between two and three months, depending on the severity of the break and the individual, so on and so forth. Okay. What has to finally happen is that the bone needs to then remodel. Okay. So this inner part has to be reopened to the medullary cavity. Compact bone needs to be laid down, right? and that's going to reconstruct the walls. Um, you can see that there is some differences here. Right? You can still see where this healing occurred. And somebody who's trained can look at an x-ray and see where a bone has been broken even years after the break has occurred and been remodeled. Now, there are some homeostatic imbalances right, or pathologies that lead to problems with the bone. Um, there is something called osteomalacia. This is where you have the bones that become weakened, where you get soft spots. This is pain when weight is put on the affected bone. This is usually caused by insufficient calcium in the diet or a vitamin D deficiency. And this would occur later in life. This is not developmental. This is where you have weakening of the, the bones. Rickets is when you have lack of calcium or vitamin D in childhood. The bones do not become ad adequately mineralized. And as the child grows, the bones can't withstand the weight properly, and they lead to bowing, especially bowing of the legs, deformity of the pelvis, the structure of the rib cage, sometimes the skull. Um, Rickets has, for the most part, been practically eliminated in the United States. Um, the United States has amazing social welfare and programs like WIC um, to try and ensure that all children get calcium and get vitamin D. Um, in other countries, though, it is still really, really, really common. Right? <clears throat> um, 
there are some kind of interesting issues with this. Strangely enough, um, women who are breastfeeding, breast milk does not have terribly high levels of vitamin D in it. So there's a recent push that breastfeeding mothers actually supplement themselves and or the baby with vitamin D. Um, uh, so lots of, lots of pediatricians now recommend that infants that are only being fed breast milk get a vitamin D supplement. And there's a lot of people up in arms about it, whether it's the right thing to do or not. Um, if you take a look um, throughout the world, though, um, in places where breast milk isn't a possibility, there are still big pockets of rickets. Rickets is still problematic. Uh, rickets, if you see somebody as an adult who had rickets, um, you probably have to, in, in our generation, you probably have to look at somebody at least in their 60s, at least in their 60s. Another thing that occurs later in life, this is osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, um, there's actually several different things that can cause osteoporosis. Um, this is where the spongy bone of the spine especially becomes very vulnerable. It's a weakening, osteoporosis, osteoporitic means holes in the bone. We actually get um, a point where the bone can be so weak that very small trauma can lead to breaks of the bone. Um, this is very common in postmenopausal women. Um, if you've seen commercials for things like Boniva, uh, Sally Fields does the Boniva commercials. These are drugs that are uh, meant to kind of help prevent this. What occurs with osteoporosis is those osteoclasts are actually outpacing the osteoblasts, so they're breaking the bone down faster than the bone can be relayed down. Um, the best treatment for osteoporosis is prevention, right? So as young people, um, having the bones be as strong as possible now. So doing things like making sure you're getting sufficient amounts of calcium and vitamin D, doing weight-bearing exercises, um, and then later in life when menopause hits for the females, um, doing sometimes hormone placement therapy. Men can get osteoporosis, but it's much more common in females. So it's really most of the marketing is towards females. Um, the last thing is something called Paget's disease. Paget's disease, um, you have excessive bone formation and breakdown. Um, so you get way too much spongy or woven bone compared to compact bone. The woven bone is where bone gets broken down. You see woven bone first. So here you get, again, spotty weakening of the bone, um, and that leads to this overall problem.